right. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out and turn to Genesis chapter 9. We've decided to make this series really, really easy. If you're not familiar with the Bible, very first book in the Bible, just open it up to Genesis. Uh, actually, chapter 11 is where we're going to be uh, today. If you've been with us, we've been walking through the book of Genesis, just starting at the beginning. We're going to walk through uh, the entire book, so we're going to be in it for quite a while. So when you come, just open up to the book of Genesis. It's probably where we're going to be. But as you think about uh, Genesis, it is the oldest book that we have, right? It, it talks about the beginning of time. But one of the things I want us to, to understand and realize and think about as we, we look at Genesis is that Genesis is not old, but it's eternal. The Bible's not an ancient manuscript, it's an eternal manuscript, which means that it's not only timeless, it's timely. Matter of fact, the more that I've, I've read and studied Genesis, the more relevant I think it is for today that, that as we look at it, this is a timely word uh, from God. So we start off in Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, which is a huge statement that God started something, created something out of nothing. He didn't take some stuff that already existed and make something. He, he took nothing and he made something. He created Adam and Eve, the very first human beings perfect fellowship with God, no death, no suffering, no sickness. They just walked around naked. They had no shame because there were no inhibitions. They weren't ashamed of anything because there was no sin in the world. But Adam and Eve were what? They were tempted by the serpent, Satan, sin into the world, separation from God, sickness, death, destruction, all the things that we wish we could get rid of today entered the world because of Adam and Eve. And as you continue to walk through these accounts Cain and Abel, the first two sons of Adam and Eve. Cain killed Abel. You have murder. You had four people. Now you're down to three. Uh, you have this expansion of humanity. It grows and grows and grows. God said, be fruitful and multiply. And what you see when it comes to Noah, which we talked about the last few weeks, is that the thoughts of all mankind, every single man, was evil all the time. Right? That, that's, a, that's a big thing to think about. Not People were pretty good, but there were some bad apples, which is how we tend to think today, right? Essentially, mankind is good, but there's some bad apples. God said, no, no, no. The thoughts of man were evil all the time. And literally, it says that, that God kind of sighed that he had created mankind. And so what did he do? He found one man, Noah, who he showed grace upon and his family saved them, flooded the whole earth, destroyed uh, every living creature except for Noah and his family and the animals on the ark, which leads us up to uh, today, which is basically this, this story, this account of the Tower of Babel. Now, how many of you ever heard of that story before, that account before? All right, maybe you're thinking like, oh, growing up in church, I think I remember it. There's like a flannel graph in my class when I was a kid uh, of this building kind of deal, but I don't exactly remember uh, everything about it. And, and so as we think about Genesis, and again, even coming up to today, Genesis is a book about blessings. Over 80 times in the book of Genesis, it says, God bless, God bless, God bless. So if you have this idea that God is like this mean God and up in heaven, and he's just waiting for me to mess up because he wants to zap me, that's not what we see in scripture. We see that God wants to bless, but God blesses obedience that ultimately leads to his blessing. And that's key for us today. So if you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 11, we're going to pick up in verse one. Now it says, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as the people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. So what you're seeing here uh, from the flood until now is, is technology advancement. They're not just taking rocks and piling them up and you know, living in these kind of stone dwellings. They're actually creating bricks, heating them up. And, and it says that they, uh, they made bricks, they burnt them thoroughly. They had brick for stone. They had bitumen for mortar, which is like an asphalt. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to the city and to the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, there are one people, they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their languages so they may not understand one another's speech. 
So the Lord dispersed from them from there over the face of the earth and left off, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Would you pray with me real quick? God, thank you for today. Thank you that we woke up this morning and we had breath and life and we were able to come corporately as your body and worship you. Lord, we thank you for your word that is truth, that you give us your word so that we can know you, your character and who you are and God, how you desire to have a relationship uh, with us. But there's also guidance and direction that we see in your word for how we're to live life. So God, I pray that as we look at your word this morning, your spirit would be in this place uh, and that Father, you would just speak to our hearts, God, that we would be more obedient to you, more like your son, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. So the first thing I want you to see, if you have your little notes, you kind of follow along, is, is what I'm going to call the sin of Babel. And this is kind of like the micro sin. This is the first attempt at globalism. The first attempt at globalism, right? The first appearance that we see in scripture. And basically this idea of globalism uh, is the spirit that we'll read about later on in scripture, what's called the spirit of Babylon. If you go to Revelation, we're in the first book of the Bible, you go to the very last book of the Bible, chapter 17 and 18, it talks about the spirit of Babylon. Now we know later on, Babylon is a real city, it's a real area, there's a king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar and all those things, but there's a spirit in the Bible called the spirit of Babylon. And the spirit of Babylon always represents humanity's attempts to dethrone God. And the attitude, when you see the spirit of Babylon, you see those words, the spirit of Babylon, it's basically, if we could just all come together, one world, one religion, one government, we can solve all of our problems. We can have heaven on earth. Sound familiar? This is the first attempt at globalism, the first time that we see this spirit of Babylon. And it's this idea, again, of of oneness, that we can have heaven on earth. And as we look at at Genesis, again, it's not an old book. It's it's an eternal book. It's a timeless book. It's a timely book. It's not old stories. It's the same stories over and over. We see them today. I said that this was the first attempt at globalism. We see the same evil spirits at work in every age. New people, but the same demons. Now think about some of the ideas. The United Nations. Let's get all the countries together. Let's have one kind of governing body over everyone. We're no longer individual citizens. We're called to be global citizens. Or or think about the European Union. Or no borders. Let's have no borders. It's just one big free for all. Every place is just, it's a global community, global citizenship. And we see this coming out in our progressive thoughts all over. If you watch the news, you see all these same ideas, the same spirit of Babylon that we see here for the very first time. Again, new people, same demons. Satan is not that unique in that that he doesn't come up with new ideas. He does the same things over and over and over again. So the first thing we see kind of this, again, macro sin is the sin of Babel, but then we see man's disobedience. Look in verse two. It says, as the people migrated from the east, let me just stop right there. If you're reading your Bible, if you've kind of kept up with us, that's physical. He's coming from the east. They're migrating from the east, but it's also symbolic from away from God. If you remember when Adam and Eve were in the garden, When they were cast out of the garden, they went to the east. When Cain was confronted for killing his brother Abel, he went to the east. Here again, they're going to the east, migrating to the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. Now, up to this point, everybody is one area of the world, right? We're we're not in Australia, North America, and South America, and all over the place. Everybody lives in this area that we would call today Mesopotamia, which would be modern day Iraq. So the entire population of the earth lives in this one area. Remember, the whole earth was destroyed except for Moses, I mean, Noah and his family. They settled Mount Ariat. Their family dispersed, began to multiply. So everybody lives in this one area, this one region of the world, and everyone speaks the same language. There, there's not Chinese and Japanese and 
Spanish and Portuguese and English. There's one language spoken. Now, if you think about it, there's 193 recognized nations in the world today and over 7,000 spoken languages. Now, when you read stories, especially stories in Genesis, it's easy uh, to kind of read them and go, well, this is symbolic. This isn't literal. This doesn't really happen. It was a story that was told to basically convey an idea, something that we needed to learn, maybe a truth. It's not literal. But, but what I want you to see, if you're one, someone that's kind of a skeptic and you're not sure if these things are true, a couple of things that I want you to, to think about when you process the Bible and Christianity and whether these things are true. First of all, when science is honest, very many times it supports what scripture says. When science is intellectually honest, it supports many times what the Bible says. Archaeology has been the Bible's best friend. The more they dig, the more they find that the things that we read about in scripture that in years past, people are like, well, we don't know that that's true. We've never seen that before. And they keep digging and they're like, oh, whoa, <laughs> it is true. So you have science when it's intellectually honest, it supports the Bible. You have archeology span that's been our best friend but you also have secular linguists who now say, and you can look this up on the internet, that all language came from one original language somewhere in the Middle East. That all language on the earth, and they have it broken down to like seven or eight different categories of languages in the world, that all languages began with one single language. Linguists would say that that language has disappeared. Matter of fact, they're working to try to figure out what that original language is. There's some uh, uh, recordings you can listen to on the internet of them trying to basically speak what they think is this original language. So, so you have linguists saying, hey, what Genesis chapter 11 says happened actually is true. There was one language from a Middle Eastern country that became all the languages of the earth. Now, think back to God's original command, Adam and Eve. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Then he goes to Noah. God destroyed the earth. All of humanity except for Noah and his family. They get off the boat. It says that God blessed Noah and his sons. And he gives them the same mandate again. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Now, what is happening here? Is that what they're doing? Are they spreading out? Are, are they filling the earth? No, they're, they're actually doing the opposite. They're, they're settling in one place. They're saying, hey, you know what? We don't want to spread out. We don't want to populate and fill the earth. We want to be in this one place and we want to, to make ourselves great. And so ultimately what this comes down to, and you think about man's disobedience and this, this account of the story of battle it is God's plans versus my plans. You ever see any conflict in your life between those two things? My plans this is what I want to do. This is my desire for my life. This is who I want to marry. This is the school I want to go to. This is the job that I want to have versus God, you're a good God and a good father, and you love me, and you want good things for me. God, what do you want for my life? See, they've chosen man's plans over God's plans. They were disobedient, man's disobedience. And one of the things I figured out, I'm 51 years old. It took me this long to figure it out. I'm not a very good God, right? When we're young, we think we know everything, and we think, you know what? This is my plans. This is what I have for, God doesn't know. God's this old guy that lives in the sky and he doesn't really know about my life and what my desires and plans are. He created you. Like gave you the personality and the thoughts and the abilities that you have. God loves you. God, just like we read about and just wants to bless you. And eventually, hopefully, at some point, you figure out, I'm just not a very good God. God is a good God. I'm going to, to trust him. So we see man's disobedience in verse two. And then the second thing we see is this love of security that they have. Verse three and four, look at it with me. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks. Let us burn them thoroughly. 
They had brick for stone, bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, what are some words that you see over and over in that section of scripture? Us, 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 we, ourselves. You know what you don't see anywhere? God. It doesn't say, and they gathered together and they prayed and they sought the face of God for what his plan would be for them and their lives and their city. No mention of God here. They said to one another, not God, one another, let us, let us for ourselves, make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed. There's no mention of God. They're not seeking God. They're not desiring his plans or purposes for their life. Ultimately, what you see here is they're not trusting God. The God who blesses, who who wants to to bless his children. And and one of the things that you'll see, because if they're building a city and they're building these these, uh, towers, they're probably also building walls, because that's what we do in cities. We build cities and we build walls to separate us, to protect us for security. Another thing that I've learned in studying scripture and just getting older is also the fact that that decisions made in fear lead to poor decisions. That's exactly what's happening here. We're fearful. We don't trust God. He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. We don't want to. We don't know what's out there. We want to huddle up. (laughs) And we do that even sometimes in our churches, right? We just have our little holy huddle. Let's, let's. We're fearful of the world. Let's stay here all together. And they're just, they're fearful. And fear always leads to poor decisions. They're being disobedient. There's this love of security. So my question would be for you, who is your security or what things are you trying to secure your life? Your bank account? Your retirement? Your job? your house, like this whole list of things that that we're trying to accumulate, that that we want to have. We want to check the list and check the box so that we can have security. Now, there's nothing wrong with security in the sense that we want to make a plan like, you know, hopefully, I I hope to, God willing, if I live long enough, retire one day. And, And when I retire, I would like to have some money to live. So we save a little bit for retirement, right? We we want to make some plans. We did the same thing for our our kids' education. So there's nothing against making plans, but ultimately, where's your trust? And one of the things that I would encourage us, when you think about the love of security, we can make our own plans, but we hold everything very loosely. Because if God comes along and says, hey, that's this thing that you thought was going to make you secure. I have a different plan for you. Do we say, no, God, I got to hold on to this. This is my security. Or do we live with our palms open, with our hands open? God, whatever you want to do, I trust you because you're a good God. So let me just ask you, is is God a part of the process when you think about your security, when you think about your plans? So you have man's disobedience, you have a love of security, and then you have... uh, the love that man has for praise. Let me just ask you a question. This is church, so you can be honest, right? How many of you, be honest, like to be liked? Like, I like people like me. Most of us in here, and even if you didn't raise your hand, like, I don't really like to be liked, you're probably not being completely honest, right? That's like something you've built up in yourself to protect you from thinking that other people may not like you. Ultimately, we all like to be liked. We want someone to think, okay, he's a pretty nice person. I enjoy his company. I like being around this person. So so we like to be liked, but this this is taking it to the extreme. This is not, hey, I want to be friendly. I want people to like me. This is, I desire, I long for man's praise, right? It says, let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. 
So what they're saying is in, in this area of the world where everybody lives and people are dispersing and spreading out and, and doing what God told them to do, this one group is saying, we're not going to. We're going to stay together for our security. We're going to make a name for ourselves. We're going to build a powerful city. We think the story of Babel is just about one building. That, that's just symbolic of what's taking place here. We're gonna build for ourselves a city. We're gonna be powerful. We're gonna be strong. We're gonna be the center of the world and everybody's gonna look to us and think that we're great. It's this desire for man's praise. Now, if you remember, again, go back to the first of Genesis. God created Adam and Eve. He created them how? in the image of himself. So when you think about our purpose, what is our purpose on the earth? Why were we created to be God's image bearers? That when people look at our life, they look at our life, they see Jesus, our lives point to him. I'm not here to make my name great. I'm here to make his name great, to be an image bearer of him. Complete opposite here. It's this spirit of Babylon again. Let us make a name for ourselves. So let me ask you, whose approval are you seeking? Decisions you make, way you dress, where you live, what you drive, friends that you hang out with. Whose approval are you seeking? Do you want people to look at you and see Jesus? Or do you want people to look at you and be impressed with you? Love a man's praise. And then the last one is idol worship. Right, all these others we can really identify with, but the last one we're like idol worship. And, and let me just kind of, there's a picture I want to put up here. Uh, this is a picture of what's called a ziggurat. Uh, this is the building. This is like the Mesopotamian version of the pyramids that you can go over to the Middle East today. You can go to Iraq today. They've uncovered these. They've uncovered the one that they think was the original tower of Babel. So, so what this was, was a, a large structure building different from the pyramids. And the pyramids were hollow on the inside, which is why they had to go up like this. The, the architecture of the ziggurats were different. They could ultimately built, be built higher than what the original pyramids were. Now, if you look at that, you're like, well, that's kind of cool. Like, that's not that big a deal. Like, you know, they're building a big tower. Like, we have towers in San Antonio. We have Tower of the Americas, right? It's, what's the big deal? Well, the purpose of these was idol worship. It's not a bank, right? It, it's, it's to worship a false god, to worship demons, so when you look at this and you follow everything, this spirit of Babylon leading away from following God, that, that we ourselves are gods, that we're going to build these things. You're going to read later on when Nebuchadnezzar has Daniel uh, uh, over in, in Babylon, he builds a structure like this that he places himself on top of, basically saying, I'm a God, you need to worship me. So there's, there's idol worship that they have here as well. So all of these things God is looking at, this disobedience that he sees over and over. And, and then the question is, and we see here, how does God respond? Like he looks down at this. He's like, I already flooded the earth once. <laughs> like we're not learning here. Look in verse five. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And let me just stop right there. How many of you appreciate sarcasm? I'm a big fan of sarcasm, right? If you don't get me sometimes and you're offended, I'm probably just being sarcastic, right? God is sarcastic. Like, I don't, I don't know, read the end of Job. It's pretty sarcastic. This right here is sarcasm. It says, and the Lord came down to see the tower. Now, what are they doing? They're thinking pretty highly of themselves. They're pretty great. We're going to build a tower up to heaven. We're going to be like God. And God, from his lofty place, is like, can't quite see what they're doing down there. It's really, really small and insignificant. Let me go down so I can see what they're doing, 
right? It, it, it's sarcasm. Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. Even that, there's no accidents in scripture. Sometimes he says that we're the, the son of man, children of man. The way he says that there is basically that's what their heart is. It's not with God, it, it's with man. Verse six and eight, and the Lord said, Behold, they're one people, they have one language. We already said that. It's the only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they will propose will they not be able to do. Nothing will be impossible with them. And, and let me just stop right here. And I wanna be always careful when I'm preaching, like what the Bible says and when there's speculation on my part. Speculation on my part, okay? We're clear here. I believe one of the signs that we're in the end times is a return to the spirit of Babel. And what I mean by that is, what did God say? There's one people together, one language, so they're unified and communicating. There's no barriers. Nothing's gonna be impossible with them. In other words, go back to what we saw before the flood as technology increased, so did destruction. Mankind always uses its technology an accomplishment to actually do more and more evil things. So what he's saying is, I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna mix up their speech so they can't communicate with each other, and I'm gonna disperse them around the earth so they're not together. That's actually a grace action on God's part. He's going, listen, I'm gonna do this to keep them from destroying themselves. And for all of history from that point until now, over the last couple of hundred years, People were spread out all around the earth. People couldn't speak the same language. Technological advancements in different parts of the world couldn't be shared with other parts of the world. But now you can communicate with anybody in the world. Language is not a barrier anymore. Distance is not a barrier anymore. Separation is not a barrier anymore. The spirit of Babylon, one world, I'm a global citizen, is upon us again. And I think that that's one of the signs in, in, that we're living in the end times. Now, when I say that, I don't know if it's tomorrow. I don't know if it's 100 years from now. It could be 1,000 years from now. But we're definitely moving back to this spirit of Babylon that you see here in this story. So God says, let us confuse their language. They may not understand. Lord, disperse them over the face of all the earth. They left off building the city, again, that's a grace action on God's part. It's not punishment. It's him saying, we're gonna disperse them, we're gonna mix up their languages so they don't get to a point where they ultimately destroy each other. That's what we see here. So apart from God, what do we always see? Apart from God, we always see confusion, right? No truth or purpose. We always see a scattering because we all go our own ways. We don't have that, that truth, that center to align us there's always division. There's never peace. This idea that, that we're going to have peace in the world, peace on the earth. I heard someone say one time, the only time we'll ever experience peace on the earth is if everyone stops to reload at the same time. Some of you will get that later. Why? Because ultimately, our technological advances, our advancements leads to destruction and division and ultimately failure. The Bible talks about apart from God, what can we do? Nothing. Nothing that has eternal value. Nothing that is ultimately eternally significant. It doesn't mean that we can't make advances. We've seen that. But we're talking about there's failure in the sense that none of it has any eternal value. None of it goes with us. Apart from God, we can do nothing. So we have to ask ourselves then, what does God want? Like, what's his desire? They, they obviously were disobedient. What did God want from his creation? Number one, he wants us to trust him. God, your heavenly father who made you, who loves you, wants you to trust him. Another word for that church word for trust is what? Faith. That we would have faith in God and that our trust and our faith would lead to obedience. What is obedience? I'm listening and following what God has told me. That's being obedient. And ultimately, what we see all throughout Genesis and all throughout the Bible, and maybe you've experienced it in your own life today is, 
When we put our faith in God and we're obedient to God, God blesses us. Now, I'm not talking about materially. This isn't health, wealth, and prosperity that God wants you to be rich. That's all a bunch of stuff. What I'm saying is God blesses us. He blesses us spiritually. He blesses us in our relationships. He blesses us in our family. And sometimes God does bless us materially if he thinks he can trust you with what he gives you. God ultimately wants to bless us, but we have to trust that God is good. We have to be obedient, leading to blessing. And all of this, by the way, we're going to start next week. We're going to be introduced to Abraham. Abraham is the antithesis of what we're reading about the the people here in that Abraham, God's going to go to him and Abraham's not even a follower of God at that point. I'm not really sure outside of faith. God's like, hey, I want you to get your family. I want you to leave and go to a new place. And Abraham's going to be like, where do you want me to go, God? And God's like, I'll tell you later, just leave. How many of you would be willing to do that? Hey, you just need to just go. Go where? I'll tell you later. Just start going, right? So, so there's trust and there's faith and obedience to do what God has called him to do. Again, we're going to see that introduced in Abraham. But God desires good things for his kids. Now, maybe you've read the Bible your whole life. Maybe the Bible is something new. Inside the Bible, there's lots of individual books written by dozens of authors in multiple languages on multiple continents over thousands of years. 66 books, an old and a new testament, but it's one book. The continuity, there's one story. God's redemption plan for mankind. So we see all the way back in Genesis chapter three, when sin enters the world, God says, hey, I have a plan. And he gives us the first glimpse of a Messiah, of the Redeemer. We fast forward to the New Testament that Jesus came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again so that we could ultimately experience forgiveness and eternal life in a relationship with God. So you think about and fast forward to Matthew chapter 28 which if you've been around church, is called the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. So all the way back in, in Genesis chapter 11, what does God want from his children? Faith and obedience. Fast forward, the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. What is a, a disciple? It's someone who has put their faith and trust In Jesus Christ, what does God still want from us today? His desire for our life, faith and obedience, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. It's one book, one story. So let me just close with asking you this question. Has there been a time that you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? That you recognize, hey, you know what, I, I'm a sinner, which means that I miss God's standard, his mark, which is perfection, and we all fall short of that. And, and so I recognize that I've made decisions and I've done things that fall short of God's standard, God's glory, which is sin. And because of sin, we're separated from a holy and perfect God. But God, because he loved us, again, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, started pointing us to Messiah. God made the first move. He took the first step. He stepped out of heaven and came to the earth. Like Jesus is the exact opposite of everything that we just read about. Jesus was humility, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. He made himself nothing, stepping out of heaven, coming to the earth, taking the form of a servant, the opposite of what we just read. Let us make for ourselves a name and be great. Jesus trusted his father. Jesus was obedient to his father. Jesus came and died for us so that we could have life, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could experience life in Jesus Christ. So if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, in just a minute, the man's going to come out and we're going to have another time of worship. We're going to have some folks available at the front that if you have questions about how you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, we'd love to take God's word and share with you how you can be saved, how you can be forgiven. That's the faith part. If you're here this morning and you're like, I've done all that, maybe it was years ago, decades ago, months ago, days ago, I don't know, but you're like, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, well, let's go to the second part. What about obedience? 
Teach them to obey all that I've commanded. How's that looking in your life? Do you trust him? Are you obedient to him? Do you, do you follow? Do you get in his word? The, the, the Bible says in Romans 12 that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Then we'll be able to know his good and pleasing and perfect will. Are we being obedient? See, the same thing that God desired in Genesis, faith and obedience, is the same thing that he calls us to today. Faith and obedience. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for your word and the truth of your word. And God, this timely message. God, that, that an account of something that happened thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago is so relevant, it's so timely for today because your word is timeless, it's eternal. God, it's, it's the same demons and the new people. It's the same lies that the world tries to tell us. God, I pray this morning, Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus, that your Holy Spirit is, is moving in, in their hearts and convicting their hearts that this morning might be the, the time of salvation when they're, when they're saved, when they're forgiven, when they begin a, a new life in Jesus Christ, when they become a new creation. So Father, I pray for salvation, for faith. And then, Father, I pray for those of us that know Jesus, God, that we would continue to walk in faith, but also in obedience, God, listening and obeying the things that you call us to, not because you're trying to keep us from something. That's the lie of the devil, that obedience is you keeping us from things that we want to do, keeping us from fun things. It's actually the opposite. You're a, a good father who loves his children. Father, help us to have faith. Help us to be obedient. Help us to love you, Father. We thank you that you loved us, you showed your love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Father, again, we praise you. In the awesome name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for our online worship service. God is doing so many things at Mission City Church that we would love for you to be a part of. Just go to missioncity.church to learn more. I also want to encourage you to worship today through giving. Click the Give button at the top of your screen and you can be a part of our mission in that way as we continue to see God transform lives here in San Antonio and online. We'll see you next week.